In this section, we're going to finish this three-part series on aircraft battery maintenance. Now, just as a reminder, this NCAT AET test preparation course will get you ready for the avionics technician, uh, electronics technician certification test. But as most of the subjects in this certification, we're also going to cover a lot of the material that will be in the FAA AMP general subject, especially the basic electricity portion, which is this bat part of batteries will be. Aircraft batteries tend to be relatively heavy and can be mounted either to a firewall structure in the engine compartment or these can be mounted into the tail section to help with weight and balance issues for certain aircraft. For firewall mounted batteries, now these are accessed by removing the upper cowling and then you can access the top caps or open up the uh, battery box if it's there. This is also where you can inspect the main feeder cable for power and the ground cable. Other battery locations are going to be more challenging to access, especially those that are mounted in the tail of the aircraft. Now, in this last section, we're going to discuss how these batteries can produce dangerous vapors and high heat, the heat from significant amperage during charging and discharging. These hazards require maintenance to pay particular attention to the installations for venting uh, of those gases and security of these very highly volatile and highly dangerous cables. It is vital to maintain an aircraft battery properly to ensure that it will start when it needs to. In addition, aircraft batteries must be able to operate in extreme temperatures. Temperatures so hot that it could boil out the electrolyte or well below freezing where this piece of plastic in an aircraft can turn into a frozen ice box. Now, a battery that has water in a case would typically freeze in extremely low temperatures. But if the battery is maintained in a fully charged condition, the sulfuric acid in the electrolyte will act as an antifreeze. However, but when the charge is allowed to discharge past those uh, lower lows or this critical load, so this could be because of parasitic loads, that battery would begin to freeze solid. Freezing electrolyte means no electrons can move in and out of solution. Now, we're going to talk about those parasitic loads in a few minutes. Aircraft batteries are mounted onto at least a drip plate, or these can be enclosed completely inside a battery box. Now, since the lead acid battery can spill fluid, now most will have a drain pan with a port overboard to allow the spilling of the electrolyte to go overboard. Again, this is a drain line that needs to be secure, free from kinks and bands, and of course, free from debris. On occasion, the battery box area will need to be cleaned using a solution of sodium bicarbonate, better known as baking soda. Now, many times, this solution can dry in the tube clogging in it. Technicians need to be able to rinse all the solution out of this tube and then clear it with shop air to make sure that this line is clear. Some battery manufacturers recommend a vent system like the one shown here. First, fresh air is brought into the battery box from an intake vent. The next, that air is passed over the top of the battery collecting the vapors, and then it sends it to a vent tube that collects to a sump jar that's filled with sodium bicarbonate, that baking soda we talked about before. Now, the baking soda jar at the bottom will neutralize the sulfuric acid in the vapors, and this will send clear air overboard. The battery manufacturer then will recommend adding a maintenance item that will need to ensure that this is inspected at least annually to clean the jar and replenish the uh, baking soda. Another focus of attention for the battery are these two large gauge cables that supply power to and from the system. Now, these cables are crimped to large lugs that are attached using steel hardware, mainly stainless steel hardware. Now, this hardware must be free from corrosion and adequately torqued 
to prevent it from loosening. Now, because sulfuric acid is corrosive, it can permeate the lead post of some batteries, which, over time, will loosen the post connections. The connections periodically need to be checked for security and the surface being free from corrosion. Now, if the post is tight and no breakdown is present or corrosion is present, it is not recommended to just remove and retorque the connector periodically. Because it's a soft metal, these repeated actions will cause damage to those lead posts over time. Well, let's look at lead acid battery maintenance procedures first, especially these precautions. Because of the dangers involved with the acids and the vapors, which includes the risk of explosion, burns, and uh, also the dangers of short circuits, technicians need to be extremely cautious in working with them. However, if a technician follows some basic rules of safety, they can minimize or prevent injuries to themselves or others. When disconnecting the battery from the aircraft, always remove the negative lead first and install it last. Now, knowing that current flows from a negative electrical potential to a positive one, removing the negative lead first will break contact with the positive charge at the battery. Also, remember to secure cables away from the battery to prevent accidental short circuits. Before reinstalling the battery, clean the posts and contacts of all corrosion, oils, and grease. Apply and torque the positive post first, then the negative. Always wear safety glasses. Even the slightest amount of acid will do permanent damage to the eyes. Now, if you're exposed, flush with clear water and seek medical help. Do not put baking soda in your eyes, because this could actually damage the eyes as much as the acid did. Now, most all shops that perform battery maintenance should have an eye wash station in the immediate area, and it needs to be in good working order, and all technicians need to know how to use it. Never service a battery near an open flame or anywhere there's sparks potential. The electrolyte vapors can be explosive when exposed to open flames. Now remember, the byproduct of charging a lead acid battery is that hydrogen from outgassing. Now hydrogen gas will be lighter than regular air and will tend to congregate above the battery. This gas, in high enough concentrations, can explode with the smallest of sparks. Now, many batteries have exploded by technicians just simply placing the positive lead on last when attempting to connect a battery or even when connecting a battery charger or when jump-starting an aircraft. Do not cause a short circuit between the battery terminals. When working around a battery, be careful with your tools and the aircraft structure when handling the battery. Now, many times a battery has been shorted out by mechanics placing metal parts on top of the batteries. It looks like they make great shelves, but that's not a good idea. Now, there are plastic covers that you can install on the positive post to minimize the hazard. But the best thing to do is just simply don't leave your tools or don't put anything on top of a battery when working on it. Another best defense is to get short circuits is treat a battery as a hazardous component. When working on an aircraft and you need to dis work on a system disconnected for any length of time, remove the battery from the aircraft is the best practice. Let's talk about jump starting. Rule is, never jump start an aircraft from another power source if the batteries are nearly fully discharged. So when we try to start an aircraft battery with a dead or nearly discharged battery, the danger is, is that we'll have a lot of massive amount of outgassing. And the other problem is that when the battery potential is really low, we're going to have a high amount of amps that will start to flow into the battery. Now, this high charging amp rate may cause the electrolyte to boil or really badly outgas. This outgassing is very flammable. 
and could explode when the jumper leaves are removed. Now, the best way to limit the gas produced is to charge the battery at a safe rate on a bench. After the battery is charged, then replace it in the aircraft. And then that's true for a battery that is fully discharged. Now, a battery can be safely jumpstart from an external power source if the battery is just too low to run the starter. Now, to test this level of charge, a technician could use a hydrometer. Let's talk about the hydrometer test. For a lead-acid aircraft battery, it's typical to use a hydrometer tester to determine the battery's state of charge. Now, a hydrometer uses specific gravity, and specific gravity is defined as that ratio of the weight of a given volume of a substance to the weight of an equal volume of pure water at plus four degrees Celsius. Now, the acid in the electrolyte becomes chemically combined with the active material in the plates as the battery discharges. Hence, less battery acid remains in the electrolyte. Now, as the battery is discharging, that electrolyte becomes more chemically closer to pure water, which means it changes its specific gravity. However, before a technician can take a reading, the electrolyte in the battery must be at the proper level based on the battery manufacturer's instructions. Most flooded batteries will have excess acid in each cells that help prevent recombination of gas during charge. The gases generated during charge, the hydrogen and oxygen, have to be vented to avoid pressure buildup. This gas generation deplete, depletes the electrolyte of water. So, as we have this constant cycle of charging and recharging, the uh, water in the electrolyte will need to be replenished. But do not add additional acid to the battery. Because the acid is moving into and out of the plates, it's not what is escaping out of the battery. So we don't want to replace acid. Now, the only time the acid level in a battery might be of concern is if the battery was tipped over and that electrolyte splashes out. Now, because it is difficult to guess the condition of the charge when the battery was spilled, when the electrolyte was spilled, the best method to replace the electrolyte is to take the battery back to a shop and have it overhauled, which means drain it, discharge the plates, and then refill the electrolyte. It's not something we would do in the field. When the technician goes to take a reading using the uh, hydrometer, the technician will insert it into the battery and fill the tube full of electrolytes. The weighted float in the glass tube needs to be deep enough into the material so that it will align with a scale that is matched to the chart that the manufacturer will provide. Hydrometer readings need to be corrected for temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit and below 70 degrees. Most hydrometers will come with a chart to help the technician determine what the rate of charge is and how much to compensate for temperature. Now, as a rule, 30 to 70 percent ratio of acid to water for a fully charged battery is 1.280 specific ba uh, gravity in a battery. So now, if the charge is greater than 75 percent according to the chart, the standard practice is that you can jump the aircraft battery from a power cart or another battery. If it's lower, the safest thing to do is to remove the battery and place it on a charger. Remember, trying to charge it in the aircraft will create a lot of acid and gas. So be careful about charging a near-dead battery in an aircraft. Some aircraft batteries are mounted into confined locations, and during these high-load conditions, the outgassing will produce those dangerous levels of gas, which will cause an explosion hazard. Especially if the battery box case is open, the vent is disconnected, and that gas begins to accumulate, say, in the tail of the aircraft. Now, one common for aircraft in maintaining a full charge between flights is the amount of parasitic loads that is in the system. 
To find out how much of a problem it is, we could use a parasitic load tester device. It's just a connection that connects to the battery. Now, in this example here, this parasitic load tester adapter, PTLA, will measure the parasitic load or drain on the aircraft when the master switch is off and the aircraft is inactive. Now, all aircraft will have some form of parasitic loads or drains that do affect the battery's capacity or state of charge. This will also affect the airworthiness of the life. So these parasitic loads are a small continuous flow of DC that'll take power from the battery when the master switch is off. Now, parasitic loads are anything from clocks, internal loads, relays, sometimes onboard computers that have holding memory uh, for power. These things usually are not that high to cause a problem. So depending on the magnitude of the problem, the battery in an inactive aircraft could be depleted within weeks or even days. Now, another inherent danger about battery charge is that the battery may not have enough emergency reserve power. Now, it can have enough power to start the engines, but should there be a problem shortly after, it will leave the pilot vulnerable in the case of a generator failure. Therefore, the FAA requires aircraft batteries under certain certification standards to be certified with a minimum of 80% capacity for emergency power reserve in an electrical generating system failure. Again, it gets back to that 30 minutes of failure. The problem is if that the parasitic loads are too high, what will happen is that the engine will start with enough, with enough electrical power to start the engine, but there won't be enough electrical potential in the batteries to operate in an emergency thereafter. Now, to test the system, we put the PTLA between the battery receptacle and the aircraft's mating plug. So the first thing we need to ensure is that the aircraft, the first thing we need to ensure is that the aircraft is completely shut down and disconnected from the power plugs or ground plugs. Now this PTLA is a molded propylene body that is equipped with separate test leads for connection to a digital multimeter. Now it's rated for loads up to 10 amperes and is equipped with a 10 amp fuse. Loads in the milliamp range are considered fairly normal. However, discharges in tenths or even hundreds of an amp can be a real problem, especially for aircraft that sit between flights. To find the source, the technician will need to physically remove loads in the aircraft one at a time and then watches the changes to the meters to determine what is taking the power. Let's talk about battery chargers. For primary battery charging, there are two general types of charging equipment. These are constant voltage chargers and constant current chargers. Well, starting with constant voltage charging, or CP, when a battery is charged by the constant charging method, a voltage higher than the open circuit voltage of the battery is connected to the constant voltage of the charging system. This type of system is most commonly used in aircraft installations. However, constant voltage chargers can be used by ground power carts also. For most batteries, the generator's voltage is accurately controlled by employing a voltage regulator connected to the field circuit of the generator. So for example, a 12 volt system, the voltage of the generator is adjusted to approximately 14.25 volts. On a 24 volt system, this adjustment should be somewhere between 28 and 28.5 volts. When these conditions exist, the initial charging current through the battery will be high shortly after start. As the state of charge increases, the battery voltage also increases, causing the current to taper down. When this battery is fully charged, its voltage is almost equal to that of the generator voltage, and you should not see any voltage or current flowing to or from the battery. When the charging current is low, that battery may be remained connected to the generator without damage. For lead acid batteries in a battery shop, a constant voltage charger is used, but the technicians need to really monitor current. You have to have a system that actually could control the current because of the amperage that's being produced and also to try to prevent outgassing. 
you'll see in a battery shop that when a battery is charged using the constant mole voltage system, the caps are open to allow the, the outgassing to occur to prevent the, the uh, pressures from inside the battery to become too great. Also at the same time, that you don't want to be doing the battery shop maintenance in an enclosed area. You need to have some place for the gases to dissipate. Constant current charging is used mostly in a battery shop, especially for NICAD batteries that have multiple cells. These are the most convenient for charging these batteries outside the airplane because several batteries of varying voltages, which means cells, can be charged at the same time on the same system. A constant current charging system usually consists of a rectifier that'll change the standard AC power supply to a DC voltage. Now, a transformer is used to reduce that available, let's say 110 or 220, to the power supply, 24 or 12, that the tester will need. Suppose a constant current charging system is used. So in that case, multiple batteries may be connected in series, provided that the charging current is kept at such a level that the batteries do not overheat or outgas excessively. So let's talk about how a typical NICAD battery using a constant current charger is, is used. So at a rate initially of one amp per cell is applied to the battery until all the cells have reached at least 1.55 volts. When all the cells in a NICAD battery reach that 1.55 volt level, another charge cycle will follow at 0.1 CA. 0.1 CA means talks about cells per amp. And again, to all the cells have reached that 1.55 volts. Now finally, the charge is finished when there's an overcharge or top-off charge applied. Now typically for not less than four hours at a rate of that 0.1 CA. Now the purpose of the overcharge is to expel as much, if not all, of the gases that are collected on the electrodes in the hydro in the NiCad battery. There is hydrogen on the anodes and oxygen on the cathodes of some of these gases that need to recombine back to form water, which raises the electrolyte level to its highest level in each cell, after which it's safe to adjust the electrolyte levels. During the overcharge or top off charge, the cell voltages might go beyond 1.6 volts and then slowly drop. Now, no cell should, dry, should rise above 1.71 volts, which we call a dry cell, or drop below 1.55, because that below that, the gas barrier is broken. Now, charging is done with the vent caps loosened or open. Now, a stuck vent might increase the pressure in the cell during this overcharge process. It will also allow us for refilling of water to correct levels before the end of the top off charge while the charge current is still being on. Cells should be closed as soon as the vents have been cleaned and checked. Since carbon dioxide dissolves from outside air, carbonates in the cells ages the battery. So we have to be careful about that. Let's talk about battery load testers. So the question is why use a battery load tester? These are also known as maintenance chargers instead of a standard battery charger. Well, the rate of a self-discharge of an RG, which is recumbent gas series batteries, is only about 2 to 3% per month at room temperature. Therefore, maintenance charging is only recommended if the aircraft does not accumulate many flight hours per, during the month. Flights of short legs that do not allow the battery to fully recharge, or if there's a lot of parasitic loads when the master switch power is turned off. This may require more shop battery service. In these cases, the battery should be periodically boost charged per the CMM. Alternatively, an approved maintenance charge may be used for supplemental charging. Maintaining full charge will minimize sulfate and extended lights of batteries. This is for the lead acid batteries, even for recumbent. Now, battery load testers are the class of instruments designed to assess the condition, the charge, impedance, ripple, a ripple current, and other measurements of a battery. What they do is they ensure that the batteries are working as required. So just as batteries have a very wide, a wide range of sizes and uses, 
Well, so do the testers. The testers need to be matched based on the, the size of the battery. Battery testers work by applying the load and monitoring the voltage and current of the battery. The actual process is quite simple. When the conductive elements of the tester touch both the positive and negative contacts on the battery, the current is released and that state of charge or discharge is measured. Now, discharged batteries must be fully recharged before they can be tested. If the CCV falls below 9.6 volts per cell on a uh, uh, lead acid battery, the indication bad appears on the test unit. The indication good if it's higher than 6 point, uh, 9.6 volts during the entire load test. Always refer to the maintenance manuals because there's a lot of different types of testers out there. So this brings us to the end of the aircraft battery section of this course. Uh, what we're going to get into next time is back into the fundamentals of electrical components, starting with defining of those physical switches and other electronic control devices. So, close this video, and I'll see you in the next one.